Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Mr. Eric Coleman. He is America's craft beer consultant and concierge. And this gentleman has a unique positioning, uh, uh, an offering that many in the beverage industry doesn't have. He has a BA in psychology and political science. So he's going to help us understand, you know, drinking trends and behavioral patterns that many in the beverage industry can't do. So Eric, hey, thanks for joining, man. No problem, Kirk. Pleasure being here with you. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. Okay. So could you please tell everybody, you know, your position is unique. You know, there aren't, I don't know of many like beer consultants or wine consultants or concierge. And then you're also a co-host of a podcast, fellow podcaster. And how did you go from starting in the beverage industry, you know, maybe start working in a bar or for a distributor to being, you know, a, a consultant? Gotcha. Yeah, no, I, it's unorthodox and I'm very lucky. I am very, very lucky due to my situation. So uh, to make this nice and tight and concise, 30 years ago, my father and four of his friends went from making wine through the 70s and early 80s and decided to making beer. A couple of them were engineers, including my dad. He was a math teacher, but he was an engineer by degree in trade. Another gentleman was an engineer, but owned a machine shop. They're like, you know what? There was no kegs work. So they're like, we'll build it ourselves. So they took one of the bays of my parents' uh, garage and built a three and a half barrel brew system in 1988, 89, before craft beer was cool, started making beer. They started the Ellicottville Brewing Club, uh, Ski Town, it's about an hour south of Buffalo, New York. Anyways, from there, I was able to, at a very young age, start brewing beer and you know, we are kegging it and uh, going to small competitions back in the day. And then simultaneously, that's a ski town and a good friend of mine uh, I grew up ski instructing with she married a gentleman who opened up a very large brewing company in Ellicottville Ellicottville Brewing Company in 1995 been brewing for five years with my dad in the club I'd been bartending in the town ski town and so when he opened I came over and helped him in the very early stages you know we'd go in and help them brew and then help them uh, events beer festivals things like that and their first head brewer uh, Finn Demink became friends with him, befriended him. He left, went to Chicago, got his master's in brewing, came back, opened up Southern Tier Brewing Company, which is, I think, 37th in the country. They're a part of the ABV group. It's Six Points, it's uh, Victory, Southern Tier, and a couple of cideries that make a conglomerate where the owners got together. Anyways, being able to have befriended him when he opened up Southern Tier, I was able to come in and work with him a little bit, help him through operations, events, and everything else. So, in the early 90s, before craft beer really started, it's really when we started seeing that upswing, that that uh, tick happening, uh, I was able to help open up, operate, and work with uh, some very large brewing companies. With that being said, over the last 30 years, I've been fortunate to help open up, operate uh, in various capacities, a number of brewing companies and craft beer bars throughout Western New York, New York State, and throughout the country. Simultaneously, as you mentioned, uh, that was my 40 hour week side hustle because there wasn't really a need for somebody of what I'm doing now, but I was helping wherever I could a lot of just free time and labor in addition to some consulting paid stuff. I was an educator. So yeah, I had the bachelor's and BA in psychology and then I went on for a couple of master's degrees and uh, I was big on understanding uh, people and behavior and patterns because education is education but it's like, we wanna make sure we're delivering it to the best. So making sure we're understanding how people receive and process information and where their needs are meeting them at that point, be it the teachers or the students. And when I decided to go full on into the craft beer consulting, because I left that after 20 years uh, and opening up all of this that I'm doing now, I really wanted to apply that because as you mentioned, I knew I wanted to be in the craft beer business. I didn't want to own a brewing company just shut of my own. I wanted to help everybody. I'm passionate about craft beer and kind of carved out some niches just uh, foraging ahead. But when I do work with the brewers, in addition to, you know, writing policy and procedure, helping them buy equipment and install it and hiring staff and training and all that, I, I like to endear with them aspects of how to work with making sure the staff are true ambassadors, making sure the guests always have the phenomenal experience, providing them the beverages, but then also working with the brewers and saying, listen, when you're doing this, we want to make sure as you're trying to scale up, 
how are you meeting the trends, not just brewing what you want to brew, looking at what the what the data shows from sales skews and things like that and in your particular area where you're trying to push into for marketing purposes and just really helping them be as nimble as possible because as you know, I don't care what medium of alcoholic beverage you're dealing with. A lot of times, especially for the small to medium size operations, the, the owners are doing so many different things. And so it's just kind of, how can I meet them at their speed and their scale and then ramping that up in them? Just very fortunate. And the educational component of me allowed me to take on uh, a program was kind of falling apart here at a local collegiate institution. And so I revamped and created a, uh, Trocare College's Brewing Distillation and Fermentation Program, but embedding that into the core study when people learn, I can teach you how to brew, then we're going to teach you how to do this, but it's understanding the marketing, understanding sales, understanding data, making sure it's it's a love of art and it's a science, but that's fantastic. You can brew a great beer, but if you don't know how to get it to the people in the right format and not just brewing what you want, all the things that any alcoholic beverage producer has to run into you know, reminding them that this is still a business and you got to make sure you're, you're meeting the people's needs and wants and at, at, at their level. Which is why they marketers should always study psychology. Yeah. Yeah. Could you, without spending too much time on it, could you briefly explain the three types of beer and give like a one, actually let's do this. Just if you could just briefly explain the three types of beer and then I'll follow up with a couple of other questions. Yeah, no problem. So in the craft beer world, there's actually two types. There's two in the family tree. There's ales and there's lagers. It all comes down to the fermentation process of those particular beverages. I mean, aside from some of the grain differences and things like that. So uh, lagers are cold fermentation. So when you brew those beverages, they are going to be processed uh, at a little bit of a different temperature. The grain bills are usually a little bit different. And then the fermentation process is cold. So therefore, uh, it hand, happens at the bottom of the fermenter, takes a little bit longer, the temperature's a little bit colder. And that's where with lagers, lager family incorporates pilsners, uh, kolsches, you'll have your box, triple box, um, and you know, your hellas. Uh, and some of those families, they're a little bit crisper. The carbonation, the titration of the, the carbonation is a little bit different. So when you think of a pilsner or a lager, a little more refreshing, the bubbles are a little bit different than you see in ales. And then the ale family, that beer is processed at a higher temperature for fermentation. The boils are sometimes a little bit higher. Obviously, grain bill gets a little bit more wild because in the ale family, that's the massive one. That's your everything from your golden ales to the Belgian family to the IPAs, pale ales, to the, the brown ales, the amber ales, your stout family, your porters, your barley wines, so on and so forth. And the fermentation process happens at the top of the fermenter. Your Temperature degrees is 20, 30, 40 degrees higher, depending upon uh, what you're brewing for that particular batch. And also it doesn't need as much time. You can knock an ale out and technically you can knock it out in a few days, um, sometimes up to a week. So that's that major difference. And lager family, a little bit smaller. Ale family is just much more encompassing. So the, you said the lager is cold brewed or cold fermented? Yeah. And is so when it comes to the end, the end product, is it uh, is it fair to say that based on what little I know that the cold fermenting tends to produce a lighter uh, beverage? Overall, that's that's a, that is something you could say because if you look at the lager family, you're not usually seeing beers that are popping eight, ten, twelve, fourteen percent ABV by volume. You're thinking like uh, Peroni and Budweiser and stuff. Yeah, that gravity um, is you know the hydrometer is definitely a lot a lot lighter. Okay. So can you give, say, uh, five examples of um, lagers and five of common lagers and five examples of common ales? Wait, those sure. are the two, right? Lager and ale? Lager and ale. The lager family, uh, co common things are, you think of Pilsners. You have your Czech and your German style. Uh, the differentiation, really easy and quick on that. Um, one is going to be a little bit softer, a little more bready, a little potentially sweeter based on the hops that are used the water quality as you know just like in the wine industry um the, the water quality is paramount to what's going to be produced if you have a lot of minerals and depending upon the hardness of that water which eastern europe western europe the uk have very hard mineral waters so the beers that come out of the uk and come out of there uh 
especially in the in the lagered family, um, they're a little more like bitter. They're 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 a little sharper. They have uh, because of the minerals. Yeah. So um, pilsners, you're gonna have uh, your Czech pilsners. Like you can go into the Italian, like the Peroni. Um, there's a number of delicious pilsners out there that you can have. Uh, the um, Franz and Sconer is like an OG one. There's a number of them out there. Lagers. You have everything from here in the U.S. Uh, Great Lakes makes probably one of the most iconic uh, lager. I actually use that in the brewing school as like a base example of an American lager. Sam Adams is pretty good. Brooklyn does a pretty good one. And then you go over to Europe. There's a number of phenomenal lagers um, that are a little bit more bold and robust, but still staying in that lagers. You're literally going to see them in that three and a half and Pilsners as well. Three and a half to five, maybe six percent. When you get into Bach beers, they're a little bit darker. Um, you can get into some of those variants. Helles lagers becoming kind of uh, popular today. Those have a little more uh, bitterness to it uh, from the hops and how it's processed uh, in production. And the lager family doesn't get too fancy. It doesn't get too variant strains all over, uh, the, over the place. I mean, here in the especially in Europe. They like to stay very traditional here in the U.S. We do go a little bit uh, crazy with our styles. Ales is kind of the Wild West. You go back to when I got into this, there were 12 kinds of hops out there that were basically used. Very West Coast predominant because after Prohibition, beer didn't start popping up again until the 50s. There was a couple of proprietary hops that started getting introduced in 1972 that started shaping the game. Uh, you go back to um, Anchor Steam and you can go back to like... Uh, a couple of the OGs, Firestone Walker, uh, Sierra Nevada were creating some some back in the 70s, 80s. And then and as they started popping up in tr traditional American fashion, we supersize everything according to BJCP, which is the judging or the official judging categoric uh, organization here in the U.S. to help categorize what makes this style of this and what are some aspects you should experience in it when you're doing a judging. Because I do a lot of judging here in New York State and around the country. Um Gosh, there's 172 different hop variants out there that are just oh, okay. as an example of. So when you're looking at ales, gosh, you could have everything from the whole Belgian family, which is phenomenal, to the biggest, most popular port beers today are IPAs, especially okay. your New England, your hazy and your juice bonds, which are actually all different. The West Coast starting to make a little bit of a comeback. Sours are really popular, especially when you add a little bit of lactose, some milk sugars in there. Uh, to help sweeten it and soften it. And then also um, uh, like stouts, pastry stouts, softer stouts with a lot of adjuncts are kind of like your three big okay. stalwarts. Like if you're looking out there, other half, uh, Grimm, Firestone Walker, uh, Brooklyn Brewing Company, Southern Tier. There's about a couple dozen that kind of permeate uh, the, the main. And then you have a lot of the mid-level that really try to get niche and I call them, they're like hypers. They try to create a couple styles that they just knock out, kill it, and then kind of go from there. So hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, and I'm going to take a guess that the, this craft beer, uh, I don't know, renaissance that started in the early 90s, I'm going to guess that because you had everybody and their mother basically making beers, which was, I guess you could say, like a revolution, or renaissance, a better way. I'm going to guess that probably helped the need for these different hops and other things. Am I right? Correct. Yep. Yep. Um, in nineties, a lot of, a lot of hops really became prevalent. Knowing you'd have your Simcoe, your Cascade, uh, Saz. Those are some of your traditional hops, base hops, a little more West coasty, a little more bitter, earthy, piney, resiny, dank. And then as you get into the two thousands and like later two thousands, like 2007, eight, nine, 10, the, the East Coast hop, you know, trends were really starting to take off. Softer IPAs, a little bit more fruit flavored in them, uh, things of that nature. And then Sours goes and started really kicking up. And then once you get into like the, like 2010 to 2012 is kind of like, it's, as the trend has been going up, it's just been crazy. For example, when I got into craft beer in 1989, 90, there were like, uh, I think it was like 1,200 give or take brewing companies in the country. We now this year have eclipsed 9,000. Uh, and you can go into it like in Cali, they have over a thousand here in New York state where the number two barrels production per population. 
And I think we're almost at 800 brewing companies in just little old New York state. So yeah, the, and then with that, the need for new hops, creative hops, how Cornell's, um, pardon my French, heck, Cornell, uh, a phenomenal institution for helping with agriculture. Uh, they have created a process where hops, like grapes, they take time. It's weed. It takes about seven years to come to full germination, you know, before you want to really use it as a mature hop, because if you get something that's only, say, three or four years old, this could be a lot greener, more bitter. You're not going to be able to extract those esters and those um, polyphenols and essential oils out of it. Or Cornell's come up with a process that they can create in a lab a true organic hop in about three and a half years, cutting the process wow. in half. What, uh, I had my phone on silent. I don't know how the hell it rang. I have it on airplane mode. Um, <laughs> Didn't even hear it, so no problem. The, uh, so let's talk about uh, psychology. You know, you, you have your background, your BA in that. I, I don't want to get into something too technical that'll lose people, but can you talk about psychology when it comes to the market? Like, like what you talked about what before or earlier was, you know, it's great to make a great beer, but if you don't know how to market it and get to the right people, then who cares how good it is or what you're doing? Can you talk about, and when you, and when you explain it, if you can try to give uh, something that's a real life example so people can relate to it, can you talk about, uh, maybe give one example if you want, uh, where a real life example where you helped a, a brewery, you know, talk about how you put into play psychology with finding your target audience and, and positioning the correct product with that. Did, did I explain that or ask that correctly? Yeah, yeah. No, actually, there's a number of instances, and this is where psychology definitely comes into it, and I'll, I'll keep this concise. Craft beer, unlike some of the other beverages, the flavor profiles get pretty nuanced. There's so many different... Uh, like wine. Yeah, that can come out there very much so, yeah. And in, in the beer world, it's perception is reality. Like, for example, I, what I do, Century, like I do a lot of corporate tastings or when I come to do a brewing company, help them train their staff on tastings and go, think of it this way. You got a lot of people that they like domestic. I mean, if you took all the craft beer that is produced in this country in one year, Budweiser produces out of Texas more Budweiser that they drink in California than every craft beer produced combined. So domestic is still the juggernaut. Like we are only 13% of the market. So with that being said, that's what people think. And people will be like, oh, I don't like hops. It's too bitter. Because maybe somebody gave them a West Coast IBA, Stone Arrogant Bastard, phenomenal beer. But if you take it, IPAs are polarizing. Yes, they are the most popular style out there, but it's a it's a love hate relationship for a lot of people. Sours people are like, go ahead. Sorry, no. Let, let me interject. So it's kind of like the stigma about California Chardonnay. Yes, not all California Chardonnay is. It tastes like a picnic table. For those of you don't that don't know what I mean, it's overly <laughs> buttery and oaky to the to to hell. But because of marketing, a lot of people have only tried chardonnay from california that that tastes like you're biting into a damn oak tree yep. so when i have presented wines to people from california chardonnays that aren't like that they're like no 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 i'm like oh why well no they're too buttery and oaky so that's the type basically the the misperception is what you run into yep a couple of things i do and here's some easy examples and i have a brewing company smaller one doing this and i've i've, I've used this tactic for large production facilities with full-blown 500 person spaces to smaller ones is you got to demystify. I tell everybody first things first. I say, listen, beer is like liquid art. It's subjective. It's like music. It chooses you. Get three people looking at a Monet and one wants to buy it. One wants to burn it. One's going to Let's go grab a drink. It, it doesn't matter. You know? So I tell everybody, get rid of those misnomers because what you think, you know, and what you know as tastes are different. And I say, for example, if you like chocolate, Milk chocolate, that's a manufactured processed flavor that's marketing. You ever bitten into a cacao bean that's killed very similar to a coffee and a, and a malt, you know, it's bitter, it's burnt, it is god awful. I mean, I love dark chocolate, but even a cacao bean is more intense. So I tell people, I go, so what you think, you know, may not be what you know. And then I tell them what we're going to do when I, this is a, an exemplar, an easy one. When you are at a brewing company, first things first, the brewers and the kitchen should cross train 
And then the brewers should come out behind the bar and really work at it because your frontline employees are your ambassadors. They're going to be your best sales agents more so than anything else because word of mouth, as you know, is some of the best marketing. You, you can't buy that. So you want to make sure people have the best examples. So it's like when somebody comes in and you ask them, say, listen, what do you like? And I find the data, this is where the data helps. There's about 60% of the population that I've done just from the number of brewing companies that I paid attention to as I get behind the bar and I immerse myself with that. Most of the population doesn't know what they like and they're embarrassed to say it. They're walking in Brooklyn and they're like, oh, I don't know. And I'm going to get embarrassed of it. I'm like, I tell everybody, oh, that's okay. I go, I put PBR tabloids in my golf bag. I've been doing this for 30 years. I'm a craft guy, but you like what you like and that's okay. So I tell people, what do you, when you walk into a bar or a restaurant and you're out with your best friends or your significant, what is it you get to drink when it's not a wine or a liquor? And they might say, oh, it's a Bud Miller. I'm like, perfect. You know what? That tells me something. Or if you go into a blue moon, because usually those are your, your base flavors. I'm like, okay, you know what? Most brewing companies will have some kind of a pilsner. And if they don't, you're going to find some kind of a soft lager. Or if they have a hard time because that process does take longer. And a lot of times brewing companies aren't big enough to let beer sit in a fermenter for a week and a half, two weeks, three weeks. They need to pump it out a little bit quicker. I'm like, okay, you go for a soft golden ale. Or you go for something along those lines. Like, here, try this. And you give them a couple samples. And then from there... As I do this, I'm like, here, try this. Because I ask, what are some of your favorite food flavors? Because you want to match up their psyche with what they like. Because if you can give them something that's going to slide into that palate zone, because maybe they like, you know, what's your favorite candy? Favorite candy is going to tell me what you might like as far as, oh, I got a chocolate stout or a milk stout on tap. Oh, you like sour patch kids and warheads? Well, you know what? This sour is softer with fresh raspberries. Try this. It's got some lactose in it, so it's softened up a little bit. Okay, you do like certain things that have a little bite to it. You introduce them to maybe a soft pale ale or an American IPA, or you get something that's got a lot of milk, sugar also into it. I hate to keep saying to that example, but you give them these different variants. You let them try a few things. I go three, four, five, one ounce samples will do you a world of good because they're probably going to find one. And then you can always tell anybody, listen, cider is the new carbonated wine. That's okay. You can try a cider. So- yeah, that no, that's interesting. Uh, I, and I definitely like the candy example. I didn't think of that, but it makes sense. Like if people like coffee without cream or sugar, there's a chance to like a tannic Cabernet. Um, yes. Uh, what? So, okay. So, but how would you, when it comes to say your marketing, you know, you, here you are, you got your great new craft beer and you've, you know, you tested it with family and friends. Everybody loves it. How are you going to determine who your target audience is? The, the only way I know of is to do what my company does, which is do in-store tastings. Is that, uh, you know, is that your experience or do you use a different approach using psychology or? Uh, to answer that question, yes. Beer tastings in a store is a little bit different than wine tastings just due to the state and the liquor laws and everything else like that. So it's a little bit of a dance you have to do with the SLAs, uh, depending on where you're located. So a couple of things I do is when a brewing company is like, okay, I'm here, we make this, we feel we've got, I tell every brewer a couple of things. You don't get to make what you want. You get to make what the public's going to buy or you will not be in business in three years. I don't care who you are. Oh, we're going to go distribution. I go, you're not going to make a profit probably for the first three to five years. Unless you have lightning in a bottle and you have super pockets, be careful. Oh, I'm going to make it. I'm going to produce. I'm going to go out there. I go, I hate to burst your bubble. And I'm the rah-rah guys you're opening up, but let's. I, I need you not to lose your house. <laughs> so I want to make sure you do this. And then it's like, okay, you're going to do some samplings. Go to a beer festival. Like go to... Uh, 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 like farmer's market, set up a booth. There's a way where you can go and just give away samples to unassuming people who are there for something else. Like, oh, let me try this. You might get somebody who's curious and creative. And then when you're really trying to push it out by fine, well, I said, this is where you got to look at some of the data. It's like, okay, if you befriend some of the local supermarkets, because before you go to your distributors, because also once again, I am friends with a lot of distributors, but in the beer business, it's, it's cutthroat. It's tough. And in some states, they lock you into a contract and it is not nice or pretty and they are not your friend, even though they say they are because every distributor, their biggest sellers are always going to be the domestic giants, whatever that particular brand that they carry. And that's what they love here in Western New York. We have 63 brewing companies. Very fortunate. We have a very robust craft beer scene and we have some beer 
that are popular in New York City and just they're going like gangbusters. But once again, there's one big behemoth distributor, friends with them, know them, and they do show a lot of love to the craft beer market. But when it comes down to it, you know, this particular, I will not mention names of what their brand is, but when you talk to them, 83% of their sales come from that. So as much as they love the craft, every sales rep needs to make the profit to get their commissions, to keep that. It's that chain. So I tell people, befriend a supermarket and I'll, you know, bring this in as try to find out what the best selling SKUs are. You can find that out pretty easily. I pay attention to that where sometimes people will bring me in because I, I look that data up to keep it's like, okay, in this particular market, here's the styles that people tend to approach here in the, the, the Western New York region. If you're in the central New York, which is a, a, a very big wine region and New York state wines are a little bit different due to you know the, the, the soil and the terroir, if you will, where what sells in Western New York, Buffalo area to Rochester is a little bit different in the wine region. Because if you're going from a winery to a brewery, you got to make sure you're playing with that. Okay, so basically you would, um, well, you, you would basically, you know, tell the, if you, like, if I were to say to you, okay, I'm starting a, my own craft brewery, then it sounds to me like your advice to me would be, okay, Kurt, don't get married to any one recipe, create some different batches, go to festivals, and just start handing out free samples, look at the demographics, are they all 20-year-olds, are they all 50-year-olds, are they men, are they women, are they businessmen, do they look like a housewife, and get see what the feedback is compile that information over what you'd maybe do that three to six months uh yeah and, and a little hopefully this. by then you've got maybe five thousand people who have tasted you know i'm just picking a number and then you could say oh wow 80 percent love the uh, peroni style pilsner oh let's call peroni <laughs> but yeah. is that basically in a nutshell the advice you give your clients yeah definitely it's you know Got to beat the streets, take growlers into a bar, give some free pours, like you said, festivals, because we want to make sure we're providing you. And then that goes back into that psychology. We want to provide you what you all want and create the best beers for you. Not okay, just what we yeah. want to make, but for you. And then people might come in and be like, that is garbage. Or it's like, that is a phenomenal pina colada seltzer. Even though the brewer might say, one of them around here, swear you'd never make a seltzer. And they're one of the biggest. If you ask him what his third best selling skew is right now, it's his pina colada seltzer. <laughs> He's like, God damn it, I didn't want to do this. But once again, he got creative, he exposed himself, and the people told him. And so it's like, he doesn't make it all the time, but that's just an exemplar of listen to what people want, put it out there, get a little research, a little answers, and QA. And also look at what else is selling. Like, is some of the big boy IPAs, what are they? So who is drinking what in that area? Maybe his pastry stops are killing it in your reason. So you might want to try to make one of those. If a certain sour is killing it, you know, how do you mimic something like that? Also make, put your little spin and twist on it. So you're not a copycat, but yeah, you're going to get, you're going to get everybody sale. copies to some degree. The question yeah. is, can you put enough of your spin to make it yours? <laughs> yes. Yes. What do you think it is that if you look in America, there's, well, any country, there's different trends, you know, like, like take spirits, right? I'm 51. I didn't like gin until 18 months ago when I tried the Whitley Neal gin. Phenomenal. Because all I knew was like, well, I don't want to mention names, but like so the big names we all grew up with, mm -hmm. which to me just tastes like disgusting juniper juice. I couldn't stand it. Plus, I'm not a fan of juniper. But I've noticed like over the past 10 years or so, there's been this like renaissance of like craft spirits as well. Whether you're talking about beer or spirits, have you noticed any, what, is there anything in particular that tends to be the driving force behind some of these, I don't know, renaissances? You know, like, I, I, like if you look at the movie Sideways, it came out in 2004, Merlot sales dropped and Pinot Noir sales went up. That's easy to pinpoint, <laughs> right? Yep, I love that yep. movie, by the way. Um, yeah, I hear you. But, but. Putting aside something like that where Hollywood has a direct influence, as they always do, or the media, have you noticed anything in particular that that influences uh, drinking patterns and behavior or things like that? Yeah, and it's funny you mention that because I'm helping out in a couple areas where in the craft beer world, we're on, I don't want to say like a precipice of... Uh, the Renaissance is kind of taking a couple, little bit of a different path because it's just, I call it the Americanizing supersize. We supersize everything. It's like 
bigger, stronger, more flavors. I got 13 adjuncts. I like, I had an IPA the other day. It was 12%, which was blowing my mind. And it tasted like a rainbow sherbet. I'm like, it's, what is this? I had a stout the other day. It was phenomenal, but it literally tasted like carrot cake. Like I, I, my show that I did yesterday, we did Easter and uh, Dingus Day beers and with my wife for our podcast and Facebook live and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, this is amazing. It was crazy that they did that. So one of the things that I'm seeing right now is people are trying to figure out what is that next unique flavor? Two things. One, uh, I fell into it kind of like you. I'm in beer, drink beer all the time. When I'm not drinking beer, I drink more wine, bourbon and mezcal <laughs> than I probably drink beer because I don't know about you. It's like through the course of the week, I'm tasting here, tasting here. I, 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 you know, I'm imbibing a little bit, doing sensory evaluations or whatever I'm doing. So it's like when I get downtime, I don't always want a beer. I want something else. And I helped uh, a high-end Mexican restaurant here uh, where they have authentic Oaxacan uh, flavors they infuse into it. They wanted their own beer. And I took a brewing company that was a former client. I said, hey, you can handle, I think, making this beer for them. Blended it. We played with the ingredients. And I got to really immerse myself where we're infusing like natural ingredients from Oaxaca into it. And we got some releases coming up. And then with that, I've, I've always enjoyed mezcal. They go, well, you started learning. So I've been studying mezcal and doing mezcal tastings with them. But in doing that, we were able to kind of reverse engineer some of the flavors of mezcal. And how do you put that in a beer without bastardizing the beer? And I'm like, okay. So it's like, when you mention like alcohol, you're going to see some beer trends where it's like, how do I incorporate it? Easy example is barrel aging. Everybody wants to barrel age tequila barrels, sherry barrels, carb cabinet barrels. I have seen, I now see softer ciders and light pilsers going into Chardonnay and some of the, you know, some of the bitier whites, uh, wine barrels, like, so bourbon barrel, that's just an example. And people are going to want to start in, try and start infusing some of what goes into this spirit. How do I infuse it there? Now, most liquors, as you know, it's, you know, it's, it's a base alcohol and this whatever oak or whatever that, that sits in that pulls in the flavors and makes it what it is. So it's a little bit difficult. So that is something I see breweries starting to get a little more creative with. And then secondly, because of this push to create these crazy flavors, and you go in a really good craft beer store, you'll see it. Um, going back to the basics, almost like a purist trend. If you go to any brew house and you ask the brewer, what would you, if, if you could just sit down and have this or whatever, what do you want? Keep it simple, silly. Three ingredients. I say yeast is the catalytic converter, but you know, yeast is technically also in there, but it's one of those um, soft Pilsner, soft Colch, a Vienna lager. You can't hide, like when you make a beer and you can be a pretty good brewing company, but some of these hype brewing companies, they make fruit pureed sours and pastry sauce and all these other ones. And you want to be like, but can you really brew? Because when you're putting the kitchen sink into the process, you can hide a lot yeah. of imperfections and, you know, when it goes diacetyl or not to get too, like you said, technical, but those off flavors can get masked or hidden. So I see a lot of brewers starting to do this and because people really want to hang out and meet the brewer and they ask him, what are you drinking? And a lot of brewers are like, give me something light, crisp, refreshing. And I'm starting to see that pick up like in the, the, the Northeast it's starting to happen. If you look out in Cali, you know, Southern Cali, Northern Cali, Portland, Oregon, Portland, Maine, uh, Florida, Chicago. These are some big drivers, New York state, uh, you know, especially downstate. Um, what are some of the new trends? And this is something like just softer, lighter, refreshing, you know, a lot of the campaigns now are to get, you know, cheeky is like beer that tastes like beer. And that's literally what they're running with. And they insert authentic traditional styles just to try to bring it back to where we were in the eighties before this Renaissance, this resurgence of yeah. crazy craft beer started happening. Look, man, it was, it was educational. I learned quite a bit and I'm sure the viewers will as well. And I'll let you know when it's uh, posted, but I appreciate you taking the time and sharing your knowledge, man. Um, oh, I love being on the show. Like I was honored that you reached out and thought of me. Thank you. Well, you had a unique background. I thought, wow, this would be really cool uh, to speak to this guy and have him on the show. So, man, I appreciate it. Definitely. Definitely. Thank you. And anytime love to catch up and chat and even a virtual beverage. <laughs> cool, man. I like it. You got it. Hey, take care. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you. Kurt. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.